methods that, that um, try to analyze a lot of um, proteins together, and that, that's the, the proteomics that I will be talking about. Okay, so to set the scene, um, of course we all know and we'll hear in this symposium that the genomics has been uh, very successful and has really revolutionized uh, biology and uh, then functional genomics in the form of, of uh, DNA chips has uh, given us the first glimpse of, of the genome in action and um, it has been, um, it has been a desire or a dream to, to do the same thing for proteins for many years, but the problem was that uh, you can't amplify them and they're not chips. So people wanted to do it, but, but they just couldn't for, for many decades. So, so the, um, uh, the complexity of, of the analytical complexity of, of analyzing many proteins all at once was so daunting that, that um, it, it remained a promise for decades actually. And, um, but nevertheless, to, to study, um, to get a complete picture of, of what's happening in the cell and the organism, uh, my argument would be that, that we should study also the proteins in large scale if we can, and in fact also the small molecules, and then that together will give us a, a good um, basis for, for systems biology. And um, so, so my personal ambition has been to uh, shift a little bit, so this was 99% and, and this was 1%, or still is actually, and to shift that a little bit to a more healthy ratio, so, so my um, dream is that this can also be 10% at least of, of the whole thing. And I try to convince you today that we now have the technology that, uh, that are very accurate and, and very large scale, so that, that we can actually uh, address a number of um, interesting different questions. So one, um, one feature of, the, uh, of proteomics is that you can use it in several different dimensions and I'll, I'll give you examples of all these different dimensions that you can apply proteomics to. And uh, um, the first thing is uh, in, in analogy to gene chips, so you could look at all the proteins all at once and see how they change in one situation compared to another. So that would be one thing. And and I'll show you that um, the technology has now advanced to the stage that we can actually, um, at least we're at, this, at, at the gene chip stage, and, and now they just moved the, the goalposts, as you'll hear from, from Eric with the deep sequencing technologies. So now we're still fighting to get the same depth, but, but certainly um, we can be where the microarrays were until uh, very recently. So then, then uh, uh, that is uh, the expression proteomics, and um, but what is kind of unique to proteomics or mass spec based proteomics is that you can look at all the ways that the proteins are modulated by post translation modifications and that's just becoming apparent in the last few years how extensive uh, these, uh, this regulation is by post translation modifications. They circle the spindle this way and, and also this way and the frequency <coughs> is different so you take a full transform of this and you get the mass spectrum with very high resolution and very high mass accuracy. So in physics, uh, um, you know that everything that can be measured by, uh, uh, as a frequency is immediately orders of magnitude more accurate. So that was the, the technology part, and I just um, walk you through two examples now using it for, for expression proteomics. And the first one is um, we are, of course, trying to get comprehensive. That has always been the problem with the proteomics. So, and in fact, uh, this is from a review of one of my colleagues uh, from. 2007, where he says that um, the main goal of proteomics and education of complete proteomics has remained unachieved. And on the next page, he's saying, on the basis of fundamental limitations of this whole shotgun approach, it appears that in spite of recent incremental improvements, the goal of rapid complete quantity improvements will remain elusive, as in forever. But you should, of course, <laughs> always be careful when you make such statements, and we we had been working on this yeast model system and you know, applied all these new techniques to the yeast and see whether we could actually get a complete proteome. And that turned out to be the case and yeast is a good um, model system for us because it has independently uh, been um, tagged. Every open reading frame has been tagged by either GFP or by a tab tag and then uh, uh, the quantitative Western blotting or uh, a fluorescence 
and then by that me uh, measure, we, we can independently know what is expressed in the yeast proteome. And, um, and then we actually get by, um, by our methods uh, more proteins than, than they do here, and, and we also know independently that, that our accuracy is very, very high. So, so by this measure then we um, get a complete proteome, and this is also true by copy numbers per cell. So you see here that the yeast has about 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th uh, um, dynamic range, and, uh, and in each abundance class of, uh, of proteins, the red is the mass spectrometry, so we can, we can get also the very low abundance just as well as the tagging methods. So that's, uh, at least in the yeast case, um, it, it's pos possible, and we, we did this as a Silac experiment. We compared haploid and diploid uh, yeast to each other, and um, we see exactly things like, like this. So the haploid has this sterile 18, uh, a peptide from the sterile 18 protein, because it wants to mate, and the diploid uh, cannot mate, so it doesn't express this protein. And this is exactly what, uh, um, what we found, and the reviewers made us do all this with Western blood, and, and, and the student then really uh, hated um, doing all these Western blots because they're extremely low abundance, and, um, and uh, um, yeah, it was also, um, this all came out of one experiment for, for the proteomics, but uh, compared to traditional protein chemical techniques, but it's not what we want, we want the whole proteome. So then, the development in the last few years um, uh, has been mainly on computational proteomics, so on computational methods to extract uh, information from these highly accurate data sets. I'm Claire King and I am from the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington in the U.S. Why are you here? I'm here for the 50th birthday of the Israeli Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And I am here invited to speak with, uh, with my colleagues about new work in genetics and genomics. And more uh, dramatically even than that, I am here to collaborate with my friend and colleague Dr. Efra Levi Lahad from Shadow Zedek Hospital. What is the research in Israel? How, how do you see the, how do you find the research uh, in Israel? In my view, research in, in Israel, person for person, dollar for dollar, is the best in the world. The limitation is that there aren't enough dollars in Israel <laughs> to make the research even better. Levi Lahad and I have been studying breast cancer among women in Israel. We began our work together by studying the inherited susceptibility to breast cancer among Ashkenazi Jewish women. We've now expanded that collaboration to inherited susceptibility to breast cancer among Arab Israeli women and women in the Palestinian territories.